Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks everybody for um, uh, for coming on on a, a nice cool. If you're in the north, uh, a nice cool Wednesday evening. Um, my name is Karen Tillerson, and uh, we're going to do a little bit of a review on on localization. Okay. So um, just in general, you know, when when we're making a, a clinical diagnosis for our patients in neurology. Um, there are a few steps that we go through. Um, one of those is first recognizing that there's a dysfunction and that um, and that that dysfunction has an organic cause. Um, and then uh, we try to figure out, you know, where in the nervous system uh, this problem may be uh, arising from. Uh, and and then we kind of try to figure out based on the history and the presentation and the examination and where we think the problem is. Um, whittling down our differentials to the most likely uh, potential etiologies. Uh, and then we use um, our diagnostic tests to determine what etiology is, is present. Um, you know, I, for those of us who have been doing this for a while, um, we know from uh, clinical experience that, um, you know, 85% of the time, if you do a really good history and you do a really good exam, you, you pretty much know what the person has uh, and if not, you know, definitively uh, within a few uh, diagnoses and the diagnostics can help uh, prove what we believe to be true or help us, um, to, you know, whittle down that differential even further. Um, so the part of this um, approach to clinical diagnosis that I'm going to focus on is the localization, right? And so localization is the, the diagnostic exercise of determining what site within the nervous system uh, has been affected uh, based on the signs and symptoms. And, and because I'm just focusing on the exam part of localization, uh, we're not gonna talk too much about symptoms necessarily um, that you would get from the patient during your HPI, uh, but more, what do we make, how do we make sense of what we see on, on the examination? So uh, there are two main keys to localization and that is having a base of neuroanatomy knowledge, and also being able to do an accurate and complete neurologic examination. Um, those are things that we should uh, focus on very early in our careers uh, getting down because that's vital to our ability to, to, to evaluate patients and um, uh, determine what their issue might be. Um, and we do our localization through um, a, a two-step approach. Um, type localization, uh, which is where we sort of um, bundle what we're seeing into um, a, a type of dysfunction, and then topographical localization, which is where we determine the anatomical location within the neuraxis or the nervous system, peripheral or central, um, where, what area might be accounting for all their symptoms. So with um, type localization, one of the, one of the um, types uh, that we should be aware of is focal. Um, and this is exactly what it is, right? This is a single discrete uh, neuroanatomical locus uh, that can explain the patient's signs and symptoms. And, and, and in this MR picture, we can see it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to see, but we can see that there is just a single lesion here in the, in the cervical cord. Um, that would be a, a focal uh, uh, etiology um, as we consider localization. And then multifocal, right? So this is going to be more than one locus, but they are individually discrete. Um, and again, in this example, um, we can see a couple of metastatic lesions in different areas of the brain, which would potentially cause uh, different kinds of symptoms um, based on the structures they're, they're affecting. Um, uh, th this is an example of metastasis, but another example of um, multifocal um, area, or, excuse me, multifocal uh, localization uh, is like an embolic stroke uh, where you're, again, you have distinct um, emboli affecting uh, discrete areas. Okay. Um, next is diffuse. Uh, and so this is going to be a more widespread dysfunction. 
Um, a good example and, and reflective of the picture is, um, is like a, a diabetic peripheral neuropathy, stocking and glove um, neuropathy where you know, bilateral and in generally the same locations um, uh, dysfunction. And then lastly, wait, sorry, one second, I lost my thing. Lastly, um, a specific system can be affected and it's gonna have its own uh, signs and symptoms associated with it. Uh, and that can be uh, a particular pathway or neurotransmitter system. Uh, in these picture examples, this is actually uh, an MR of um, somebody with a, a B12 deficiency. And so what you can see on the far left picture is the dorsal columns um, that are hyper intense here. And then you can sort of see that on the sagittal image that the, the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord is, is hyper intense. Um, so um, once you have an idea of whether you're dealing with a focal issue or multifocal issue or a diffuse issue or a specific uh, system being affected, um, you also then wanna think about the topographical uh, or you know, topographical potential locations, right? And so, um, those are, and I'm going to run, I'm going to run down this list um, real quick. So those are um, cortical, subcortical, uh, cerebellar, something in the brainstem, spinal cord, nerve root, um, plexus, either brachial plexus, lumbar plexus, peripheral nerve, uh, or the neuromuscular junction, or the muscle. And that is pretty much the gamut of where we might uh, see a neurologic um, structural um, abnormality or structural etiology. But I, I would encourage you to think about, um, you know, when you have somebody with a particular symptom um, that you sort of kind of run through your brain um, right off the bat, what, what areas could explain that? So if you think about, um, for instance, weakness, right? We think about all the structures in each one of these topographical areas. Weakness really could be a result of, an, of a lesion in just about any of these um, topographical regions, except for maybe the cerebellum. Okay, um, because you know your motor cortex is cortical, uh, the corticospinal tract. Um, descends down through the deep white matter, through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, down into the brainstem, crosses over at the spinal medullary junction, runs down the entire length of the spinal cord, then synapses with an anterior horn cell, leaves the spinal cord in the nerve root, um, can be part of a plexus, and then can um, then develop into a peripheral nerve. Um, and then, you know, it has to synapse with the muscle, that's your neuromuscular junction, and then the muscle itself. So, so anywhere really, except the cerebellum, you could have weakness. Um, now think if the patient has a problem with movement, right? Uh, they're having bradykinesia, you know, slow movements, or, or they have a tremor, um, that not necessarily going to be neuromuscular junction or muscle, you know, that may be more subcortical, where the basal ganglia are. Um, so, so when you hear somebody say that they have a symptom, you just kind of want to put together like a list in your head about what areas could be responsible for this. And as you go through your exam, you'll be able to, to whittle that down. So um, I have in this little chart um, just that, right? Uh, if you have um, a lesion or or something else affecting these different areas, right? Cortical, subcortical, and on down the list. Uh, then the types of signs and symptoms that you might see when that's affected. So on this list, obviously cortical, you could have hemiplegia or hemiparesis. You could have a hemisensory loss. If it's dominant hemisphere, you could have aphasia. You could have sensory neglect. Um, you could have cognitive dys dysfunction. You could have the seizure. Um, so it really just depends on the presentation of the patient and what you see on exam, how you start to, to narrow this down. Um, the other thing, and, and what you'll notice um, is that there are some similarities down the list. Like I, I just used weakness as an example. 
Um, you know, if somebody has a lesion in the cerebellum, that's going to present a little bit differently. Um, in coordination or ataxia, you could have a cerebellar tremor, you can have nystagmus, you can have an ataxic gait. Um, so it really just depends. And it's, it's important to be familiar with the underlying anatomy um, and recognizing the abnormalities that you see uh, on exam. So the other thing that I always like to, to get people uh, learning early on in their practice and their career is um, some rudimentary localizing features, right? Um, the easiest of that is the difference between upper motor neuron uh, dysfunction and lower motor neuron dysfunction. And, and just as a reminder, right, the upper motor neuron is your, is your motor neuron in the central nervous system. So uh, the neuronal cell body for, uh, for the motor tract is in the cortex. And again, that, that the axon of that will descend down through the deep white matter, the posterior limb of the internal capsule, down the brainstem crossover, uh, and then uh, synapse at its target uh, anterior horn cell. That right there, anywhere along that route, right? Cortic cortical, subcortical, brainstem, spinal cord. Um, if you have a lesion affecting the motor tract, you're gonna have um, upper, these upper motor neuron signs. A lower motor neuron is after, you know, the motor neuron, the, the second order motor neuron leaves the um, spinal cord, out the spinal nerve, uh, and out to the peripheral nerves, right? And so if you have somebody with a spinal nerve root dysfunction um, or plexus or um, peripheral nerve, you're gonna have lower motor neuron signs. And so again, just real quick as a super basic review, right? The upper motor neuron um, and lower motor neuron, both are gonna have weakness. Upper will have hyperreflexia, um, eventually spasticity. Those of us who've been practicing know that if you see, uh, like an, I'll use stroke as an example, because that's such a good, easy example to use. Right after a stroke, they're not gonna have spasticity, but they will develop spasticity. You'll get an um, abnormal plantar response, which is Babinski, um, and generally little to no atrophy. Um, certainly they can develop some atrophy um, from disuse if they, have an, if they have enough weakness, but it's, it's not anywhere near um, as pronounced as it is with lower motor, motor neuron. And so lower motor neuron tends to be the opposite, right? Besides weakness, that's the similarity, but with lower motor neuron, you're gonna have hyporeflexia or absent reflexes. Um, muscle tone will be flaccid. You can see fasciculations uh, and atrophy. So it, that I, I, I try to teach anybody who will listen about this because that's one of the easiest ways to sort out um, weakness um, and, and try and localize it. Okay, so what I did um, was I put together some, some brief cases for us to kind of to, to run through um, and, and feel free to unmute yourself and, and answer. Um, the way I like to go through this is, is just to show you um, the just basic information about the patient and what their chief complaint is. And again, um, you know, I, I won't make you speak up now because we just visited this uh, with the previous slides, but here we have a patient with a complaint of leg weakness. And so again, in your mind, that can be pretty much anywhere along that whole uh, topographic um, map. Um, you know, again, except for like cerebellum. Uh, and so we have a lot to figure out here. Um, is it cerebral? Is it brainstem? Is it spinal cord? Is it peripheral nerve, muscle, neuromuscular junction? Um, and we can sort of start to get rid of some of those as we go through the exam. So uh, um, mental status is, is normal and cranial nerves are intact. Um, and so, you know, with the, the cranial nerves intact, you would maybe think less likely brainstem um, because you, you, we generally will see um, some with a brainstem lesion, some cranial nerve abnormalities with that, um, but not, not completely off the table. It's just be much more like less like, or much less likely. Um, so if we look at this um, and we say the patient has normal strength in their 
um, bilateral upper extremities. Um, and in the lower extremities, they have some weakness um, in the right iliopsoas and quadricep, um, graded as a three out of five, uh, and, and everything else is, is normal. So um, again, I think now we can maybe start to get rid of some things off of our topograph topographical list. And, and so um, what do you guys think can, can go away from the list now besides cerebellum and brainstem? Anybody? Well, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I would imagine that, you know, if, if it's a right iliopsoas, so I mean, you really can't take out the cor cortex because it could be a stroke. You can't really take out the subcortical matter because a stroke can run through the tracks. Um, your other areas were uh, peripheral nerve. I'd really like to see the reflexes before I made a call. Okay. <laughs> you know, they were hyperreflexive or, or hyporeflexive. Right. Because that'll give me an idea upper or lower motor neuron. Very good. Yeah, so that's the only thing I'm thinking at this point is what do the reflexes look like? Okay. So our reflexes are normal in the upper extremities, um, one plus in the right patellar, and all the rest are normal, and plantar or plantar responses are down going. Yeah, so he's hyporeflexive. Um, and I would say then you would have to put it into a lower motor neuron. So maybe you can yeah. knock out the cortex, subcortical region, brainstem region, uh, spinal cord region, I would assume. It looks really like it's a peripheral nerve problem. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and, and again, this is, this is one of those uh, fun little cases where having a little bit of knowledge can help you uh, differentiate between a couple of things. But, but to Sharon's point, um, you know, the thing that has really made the difference in her decision making is the whole, is it upper motor neuron or is it lower motor neuron? And that allows you to focus your, your attention in a different area. And so this patient has um, some focal weakness, uh, just iliopsoas and quadricep, and a hypoactive um, patellar reflex um, on the right. Uh, and so um, we're thinking it's got to be what spinal root or peripheral nerve, right? Um, so what what um, spinal root is this? Anybody know off the top of your head? Is it is it like L four? Yeah, L three L four would be the patellar reflex um, mm -hmm. and quadricep for sure. Mm -hmm. Four, you can remember that guys, L4 can't kick the door. <laughs> okay. yeah. So that lucked out on that one. That's a nice trick. Um, so yeah, um, now um, having a little bit more knowledge about the spinal nerve root innervations and peripheral nerve root innervations. So the L3-4 um, is going to innervate um, the quadricep and the hip adductor. And this lady's hip adductor is normal. Um, so what peripheral nerve supplies the quad and, and potentially patella, part of the patellar reflex? I forget. <laughs> and, and it's okay. It's okay. I, and again, I, I'm picking some hard cases to start with. Um, but yeah, so, so um, the femoral nerve, right? Uh, femoral nerve, this is, a, this is a, a femoral nerve. This is actually a patient that had a femoral nerve injury. Um, so she just had some, she had iliopsoas quad and a reduced um, patellar reflex, but her hip, hip adductors uh, were perfectly fine. So um, and the hip adductor is obturator, which is a branch um, off L3-4. So um, if, I, if you had been able to have some of her history, right, she um, noticed this issue the same day she had a, a total hysterectomy. Um, and, and it's not the first time I've seen somebody come out of a gynae surgery with a femoral neuropathy 
from like prolonged retraction and that kind of stuff. So um, again, the key lessons here in this particular case is one, that it's lower motor neuron. And then secondarily, um, telling the difference between spinal nerve root and, and a peripheral nerve. And that requires knowledge of, of innervations. So very good. And then of course there, um, I didn't get to, I didn't get to the sensory, but the sensory is consistent with a femoral um, nerve dysfunction as well. And the anteromedial right thigh. Sharon gets a gold star for today. And the and femoral course, nerve is huge. I should have at least stabbed at that one. Oh, yeah, that's okay. So, <laughs> I mean, the huge giant nerve in the leg. <laughs> yep, that's right. And so um, the cerebellar testing, so finger to nose, finger to finger was intact, but there was a little bit of incoordination on the right heel to shin. Um, and that is may not really cerebellar. So I really shouldn't call this cerebellar. I should call it coordination testing. Um, and that incoordination is more uh, due to the proximal muscle weakness than it is uh, an actual cerebellar ataxia. Okay, nice, very good. Okay, so here we go, right? 52 year old male bumping into things. Um, and I would just say with this, our differential is wide open, right? Uh, what does that mean? You need the patient to tell you a little bit more, but it could be anything, right? They could have, uh, they could have some weakness and they're having a little trouble with their coordination. They could have a, um, a vertigo. They could have a visual problem. They could have, um, um, you know, ataxia, they, you know, there's all kinds of things that they could have uh, to cause somebody to bump, bump into things. So um, let's go through, through the exam. So mental status is normal, right? Cranial nerves. Yeah, uh, everybody good with homonymous hemianopsia? Sam, you good with that? Okay, so, so because we have a, we have a guest uh, who wants to go to PA school, uh, Sam. So a left homonymous hemianopsia is um, when somebody's missing, missing half the visual fields to the left in both eyes. Okay. Homonymous meaning same left, same side. Um, okay. okay. So anybody with any ideas how we can now get rid of our topography here? Probably not the spinal cord. Right, yeah, good for you. And not anything below the level of the spinal cord. We can just yeah. take that right off the table. Yes. And, and um, how about brain stem? Um, I think we could take the brain stem and cerebellum off as well. Yes, well, based on this information alone, we can yes. take that off, right? Yeah, you got it. Um, so, here we go, let's review a few other things and, and we'll see if you wanna stick with your what you're saying. Uh, so motor's normal, deep tendon reflexes are normal, plantar responses are down going. So um, we have no, does not appear to have any corticospinal tract dysfunction. Uh, sensory is all normal, cerebellar function is normal, gait is normal, no ataxia, anything. So all we've got on this patient is a left homonymous hemianopsia. So um, we'll just play the game. Where do you think uh, the lesion is for this? Probably cortical. It, cortical, yes. Where? Uh, maybe near the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe, you got it. You actually, um, it, it, it's going to, it has to be occipital lobe because mm -hmm. we're not catching any sensory tracks. We're not catching any motor tracks. We don't have any language dysfunction. We have nothing right. else. This absolutely okay. was, um, which occipital lobe? Um, well, let's see, he, the right? Occipital? Right, you got it. Sam, you're ready for PA school. Good job. Uh, excellent. <laughs> Very good. So, so yes, this patient had a right occipital uh, stroke, um, and the only thing that he had was this homonymous hemianopsia, and because he was missing things off to the left, that's why he was bumping into things, because he was missing part of his visual field. Very good, Sam. Well done. Okay. Let's try another case. 
You guys holding up okay? Everybody good? Okay, all right. Um, so here we go, numbness in the left arm and leg. And again, this complaint um, could be a number of areas, right? We don't have enough information. We don't have the exam findings. So this could be anywhere from cortical to subcortical to brainstem, um, uh, spinal cord maybe, but less likely. So here, here we go with our exam. We have a normal mental status, normal language function, normal speech articulation, normal cranial nerves, normal motor function, normal reflexes. So that kind of takes corticospinal tract out of the picture. Um, sensory function, we have a decreased touch, pain and temperature in the left limbs, arm and leg. Um, and our differential really hasn't changed that much. Um, although I think spinal cord is really even more or less likely now. Uh, cerebellar is intact uh, and the, the gait is cautious. So uh, where might we be having this issue? Are we still happy with cortical? Um, I don't think so. I'm thinking maybe more in the peripheral, but um, I'm not sure I see anything that uh, strikes out cortical. Right. So, so um, the, I think in this instance, I would agree with you that it's less likely to be cortical because if you think, if you remember back, all of us remember back to our, um, uh, neuro neuroanatomy or just plain anatomy and physiology. If you've ever seen uh, the homunculus, you know, that representation of where motor and sensory control is in the cortex for the face, well, the, the, the hand, the face and the body and the leg and the leg being more medial and the face and hand being most of the, the, the lateral uh, cortex. Um, it would take sort of a big lesion in the cortex to get the arm and the legs. And, and it would be unusual that that big of a lesion wouldn't be causing other problems for someone. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the um, sensory tracts, you know, they, they come down into a much tighter compacted um, arrangement um, what, what, and where is the sensory switching station for incoming, for, for afferent information? Um, is it in the spinal tract? Well, so, well, so we have a couple of different sensory tracts, right? We have spinal thalamic and we have the dorsal columns, uh, but they come up and, and where do they go before they go out to the cortex for processing? Does anybody, does anybody know? The thalamus? Thalamus. Right. So now you have this um, widespread track from going up to the cortex is is much smaller uh, in the thalamus. And so a, a smaller lesion could cause face, arm and leg numbness or leg and arm numbness. Mm -hmm. um, so this patient actually had a, a, a pure sensory stroke, uh, which was a small a small stroke in the in the thalamus. <laughs> Good. OK. Right. Let's see. Sharon, you, you know, let me know if we're, if we're um, getting, getting short on time. I'll just keep going okay. until I hear from you. Okay. Yeah. I asked for questions. You guys can put questions in the chat. If you're, if you're, if you're too shy to talk, that's fine too. So yeah. uh, go ahead. Yeah. And, and Sharon, feel free to, to jump in if, if somebody has a question. Yeah. Okay. So um, now here we go with unsteadiness. Um, and again, that's such, some of these chief complaints are pretty vague and could mean any number of things. Um, somebody could be unsteady because they have vertigo. Somebody could be unsteady because they have ataxia. Somebody could be unsteady because they're weaker on one side of the body than the other, or, um, or they have loss of sensation in their feet. Um, lots of reasons why somebody could have unsteadiness. So, um, if when we think about unsteadiness, though, what, what do we usually think of most? The cerebellum. Yeah, cerebellum, that's right. So um, 
we'll pay attention to when we get there. So uh, this patient has uh, normal mental status, language function, speech articulation, cranial nerves are normal. We have normal motor in all the extremities. Um, we have normal reflexes and normal plantar responses. Um, there, this patient has a little bit of diminished um, touch pin, pin and vibration in the toes. Um, it's not like a severe loss of sensation, just a little diminished. Um, and then on actual cerebellar testing or coordinate cerebellar slash coordination testing with finger to nose and finger to finger and heel to shin, that was intact. There didn't seem to be any appendicular ataxia, um, but on gait that was wide based and ataxic. So where do we think uh, the lesion along that topography might be here? Cortical? Um, I don't think it's cortical. Right, I agree. Subcortical? Um, I don't think we can actually, um, if the reflexes are intact, then we can probably rule out subcortical. Right. Yeah, if the re reflexes are normal, we probably can take cortical any anything near the corticospinal tract off the off the uh, table. Sure. How about brainstem? Um, I don't think we can take that off the table. Okay. Because of the um, sensory uh, symptoms. Okay. So if, if I said that the, the sensory loss is in both feet, mm -hmm. right, um, that's probably going to be more of a peripheral thing than a central thing. So I think, we, I think it's okay to, to not blame the sensory stuff on the, on the brainstem. Good. Okay. Okay. How about, how about cerebellum? Um. I'm not, sh I don't, I think we can take that off because the cerebellar tests were intact. Right. But the cerebellar testing was only for the arms and legs. Okay. Right. So the gait is part, actually gait is part of what we do when we look for um, coordination and, and cerebellar function. This patient actually has an ataxia. So an unsteady, in, uncoordinated gait. Okay. okay. So I would leave, I would probably leave cerebellar still on the list. Okay. Um, and because we have no um, uh, focal kind of sensory or motor um, abnormalities, I probably take spinal cord and distal off the list. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit of a, of a goof because I've mixed there, and this is a real patient. So that, um, it's confusing when you throw in the sensory abnormality there. Even, but the key to remember is that it's a very minor uh, non-contributory finding that does not have a um, direct relation to the issue. Okay. So, so as it turns out, this is a, a patient who has some dysfunction in the uh, rostral uh, vermis of the cerebellum, which tends to be more midline control. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he has that, he is a longstanding alcoholic. Um, which can cause cerebellar dysfunction and actually can cause um, an, an alcoholic neuropathy. So it, mm -hmm. he might be having a little bit of a beginning of a, a peripheral neuropathy related, related to that. But, but this was tough because that sensory testing is sort of a red herring to the main issue this guy has. <laughs> um, but good. Okay, good. Thinking through things. Um, okay, add a little bit there, Karen, like for the yep. audience, like the, yes. first thing that pop, the first thing that popped out at me was this wide-based gait reminds me of a couple of things. One, like a peripheral neuropathy, okay? Yes. Two, two, I'm always worried about a myelopathy, a cervical myelopathy. Yep. In other words, the, the cervical cord is being compressed and that's what's causing that gait. So obviously the latter is much worse than the first. So I'd be really vigilant looking at the MRI, obviously in the cervical area first to get, to get that off. Yeah, but, uh, and then I would be thinking cerebellar. So my three things were peripheral nerve problem uh, because it was bilateral. I was thinking the stocking the glove, you know, distribution. Mm -hmm. The cerebellar problem, 
or the cervical myelopathy. So I had three on my list with this. So if, if the patient had a cervical myelopathy, um, would you expect to see uh, hyperreflexia? I would expect to see a hyporeflexia, I, I believe. No, no, hyper, because it's still central. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Hyper. So the patients, the, the patient has normal reflexes, no clonus, no abnormal plantar responses. Um, I mean, anytime somebody has a gait dysfunction, um, you have to think about the possibility of um, myelopathy or, or a spinal stenosis or things like that. Uh, most of the cervical myelopathy patients that I've seen have more of a scissoring gait rather than a wide-based gait. Um, but it, Sharon is right that anytime you have a gait dysfunction, that those kinds of things are, are on your list until you look at the, the whole examination. And so for this patient, um, we can probably take myelopathy off of the list just because of the, the normal motor function, normal reflexes, no evidence for hyperreflexia. Um, so, um, but those are all, and again, because you're, you're looking at this and you're saying, what could it be and what do I need to do to sort it out? So yes, there's a sensory, a very minor sensory issue. Um, if I said on this patient that they had um, sensory loss to touch, pin and vibration that went to the ankles, uh, they can have a, what we call a sensory ataxia because you can't really feel where you're, where you're putting your feet. Um, and we see that sometimes. So um, if this patient was to have worsening of his loss of sensation in the feet, um, that would just make his, his ataxia worse because now he's got, he's got cerebellar um, uh, ataxia and then we put a sensory ataxia on top of it. That, that would be the double whammy. And, and we've seen that sometimes with our, with our alcoholic patients or those alcoholic patients that also happen to have diabetes. So. Um, very good. When you go into this um, exam, would you know that they are have a history of alcoholism before? And would that kind of um, influence your uh, exam process a little more than uh, just uh, the way we did it? Yeah. yeah so so <laughs> that's a good question. What is missing from this exercise is all the information we would gather when we take the history of their present illness, right? So typically when we, when we see a patient with a complaint, we're starting uh, with why are you here today? And then you know, making sure we know all about their past medical history. And we ask the social history questions like, do you smoke, do you drink? If so, how much, that kind of thing. Um, so yes, under normal circumstances, um, we might have a little better idea of what could be the problem based on the history. Uh, and then the exam helps us sort all that out. Right. So then we put the two things together and then we have a really good idea and we can use, you know, uh, what any other testing to help kind of confirm what we think. Yeah, good. Okay. So. All right. So here we have a patient with uh, slurred speech and trouble with their balance. Um, so uh, get ready, because this patient has, uh, has quite a few abnormalities here. So um, patient has normal mental status, normal language function, but has a dysarthric speech or um, slurred speech. Um, we have some cranial nerve abnormalities here. Um, a left meiosis and ptosis, decreased pain and temperature in the left face nystagmus, a decreased gag reflex on the left, and poor palate elevation on the left, and hoarseness and dysphagia. So what do we make of all these different cranial nerve abnormalities? Um, maybe something wrong with the brainstem? Yeah, I'm going to go brainstem too on this, right? Because there's clearly some cranial nerve abnormalities. Um, so, so the, the minute I see this kind of thing, um, I'm, I'm going to focus, focus on that area. Um, I would say, you know, because I don't know the rest of the exam, I can't say if there's any evidence of other areas being affected because 
you know, we like to think that there's one lesion to explain everything that happens, but people can have, as I mentioned before early on, multifocal areas of uh, dysfunction. Um, so, um, but for this, I'm gonna go with you on this for, for, for brainstem. Um, anybody wanna take sort of, a, um, sort of a guess at which part of the brainstem is the likely location? Well, it looks like cranial nerve five's involved. It looks like, I think, I can't remember the gag reflex. Yeah, uh, and nine and 10. Yeah, nine and 10. Okay, so we're, so we're, oh, I'm, we're seven. We're seven, nine and 10, correct? Uh, so facial sensation is five. Five, okay, so we're five, nine and 10. So that's kind of a, a big area and I'm forgetting. So one and two, three, four. Are you at the mid, are you not at the mid range? You're at the uh, ponds, are you at the ponds? Right, so, and again, you know, these cases are are kind of, are kind of tricky. Um, this is a, this is an, uh, our most common um, brainstem um, stroke syndrome. Um, and this abnormality here, and actually, let me just, I'm going to flip ahead to the next slide so that you can see motor is normal. Um, deep tendon reflexes are normal. Plantar responses are down. So no corticospinal tract is getting caught here. Um, this is one of those cases where you have a brainstem thing that's not causing uh, a motor problem. However, uh, there is contralateral pain and temperature uh, dysfunction in the right arm and leg. Uh, there is left limb ataxia. Uh, in gait, the patient tends to go off to the left. Um, so let me go back to the cranial nerve things now that you know all that stuff. So um, this, requires a, a, this requires a little bit more in-depth anatomy knowledge. So um, is this yeah. like some type of hemicord? Uh, compression, like a, uh, not like a brown saccord, but I think I'm saying it right. What's that now? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Brown saccord is, is um, brown saccord is a hemisection of the spinal cord. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, Susan. Yeah. But um, because we're, it, it's, it's not that because we have, um, we're up here in the, in the brainstem with these cranial nerve abnormalities. Bonds area there. Yeah, and and so what what Susan is mentioning is a, a, a uncommon spinal cord injury uh, that causes dissociated sensory abnormalities, um, which is what this appears to have to some degree: contralateral body, ipsilateral face. So um, the predominant abnormalities here uh, in this are are the nine and ten dysfunction. So. Uh, the reduced gag reflex, poor palate elevation, um, hoarseness, and that's due to the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, that comes off of 10 and goes to the larynx. Um, and then dysphagia, swallowing difficulty. And again, that's, that's predominantly 10. So most of the dysfunction is nine and 10. Um, so this is actually what we call Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome. Um, and the reason you get all these weird additional symptoms and, and signs in here um, with this medulla uh, lesion um, is that your, the trigeminal nucleus on the trigeminal nerve provides sensation to the face um, actually dips down into the medulla a little bit. So you're catching that with this lateral medullary injury. Um, and then the other thing, the reason that people get meiosis and ptosis, and we would normally think about meiosis and ptosis being, you know, potentially a, um, a cranial, cranial nerve related to cranial nerve three, but um, in reality, that in that lateral uh, medulla area, there are um, some sympathetic fibers that run down through there that affect the eye. And so what you do, what you're doing there is you're in, Impeding the ability for the um, eye to dilate. And so you get this constriction of the pupils related to that. 
Um, and and uh, the nystagmus, you're also in this particular area of the brain, the, the medulla, you're catching a little bit of the um, one of the vestibular nucleus. So they have all this, this in coordination, this off balance. And lastly, this, this notion of the limb ataxia here, um, another um, structure that's in this lateral medulla area is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And so you're catching a little bit of that as that comes in. And this is, and, and what's crazy, and it, it always blows my mind when I think about these brainstem things, this is just a little teeny stroke in this one little area of the lateral medulla that causes all of these symptoms. Um, it's just craziness. Um, but so this is a, a typical presentation of Wallenberg syndrome or lateral medullary uh, syndrome. Um, I apologize, my phone's ringing there. It'll, it'll go away in a second. Any questions about that? That was a great uh, presentation. Yeah, definitely. I went for the puns because I couldn't remember where my cranial nerves were located. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's okay. And, and so, you know, the, the, um, that's one of the good things about being reminded about this, uh, you know, having, um, having a refresh on uh, some of the anatomy is always good to do every once in a while, especially if you start seeing seeing patients that you aren't normally seeing. Um, the, the, um, the other thing, I mean, uh, the main lesson for this, and I, I think um, Sam had on it in the beginning, is that when you see all these cranial nerve abnormalities, you have to kind of really know that you're, that you're in the brainstem and you really kind of have to know it too when you see um, ipsilateral cranial nerves. So one side cranial nerves and contralateral side body stuff, which you do with the um, decreased pain and temperature on the right limbs and everything else pretty much is left. So this is actually a left lateral medullary syndrome. So the cranial nerves would be on the same side of the lesion and the body signs would be on the contralateral side. Okay. How are we on time, Sharon? Oh, you're at 7.31 and we did start a little late, so you're fine. You can do one more case. If I do like. one more? Yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, I, uh, let's see, wait one second. Okay, all right, here we go. So this is a 63 year old female who chief complaint of weakness. And again, if we think about localization, um, we can't comment on focality or multifocal or diffuse or anything. We don't have enough information yet, um, but this could be along most of our uh, topographical uh, map. So um, mental status is normal, cranial nerves are normal, Cerebellar testing, coordination testing with finger to nose, finger to finger, heel to shin is normal. Um, and, and now we have um, a little bit of uh, sensory abnormality. We have some uh, decreased pin to the midfoot um, with a little bit of decrease in vibration. Proprioception is okay. So um, again, if we're, if we're seeing bilateral uh, things, what would we expect to be most likely the, the reason for, for this? Like what, what neurologic location? Maybe the cortex? So remember, we're talking about distal bilateral feet. Okay. I think, um, of, a, I think of more a peripheral problem with probably something systemic. Like you think about the diabetic, you know, bilateral stocking, stocking and glove. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So you would, this would make you think, you know, probably peripheral. And again, that's going to be, you know, up to the front of our list and the rest of the examination is going to help us sort that out. Right. So here we have some weakness in the neck flexors. Um, we have some weakness in the right upper extremity. Um, 
with deltoid and triceps and, and the grip or finger flexors. We have a little bit less weakness, but a little bit in the left deltoid. In the lower extremity, we have some bilateral weakness of the hip flexor, um, left quadricep, the anterior tibialis, and the gastroc on the right. So we have a mixed sort of picture of locations. Yeah. Yeah. Is it an embolic stroke or something? <laughs> is that what you have? Like, <laughs> well, and again, right? You're you're so so. Sharon has gone from a peripheral neuropathy to an embolic stroke <laughs> because the rest didn't match at all. You start, uh, I was right. Like, it doesn't match at all, and that's what like. that is. What is so cool about neurology is that being like Sherlock Holmes and figuring this stuff out. Um, so, uh, but, but Sharon's observations are correct, right? We have something that looks peripheral. We have something now that could be central. It could be peripheral. It could be multifocal. We, we just don't know yet. We're still sorting it out. Um, now we have uh, the, the presence of some atrophy in the right shoulder girdle and the right first dorsal inner osseae, which is your web space between the thumb and, and index finger. And we can see some fasciculations in some of these muscles. Okay, so we have weakness, we have atrophy, we have fasciculations. What are we thinking? We're definitely thinking peripheral now. Right, so lower motor neuron is on Sharon's table here. Okay, so now let's look at the rest. That's not fair. <laughs> Sharon's going to regret answering the questions. Yeah. So now we have some brisk, um, brisk reflexes in the biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, and patellar bilaterally. So throughout and reduced uh, reflexes in the Achilles. And to throw a wrench in everything, the plantar responses are up going. So positive Babinski. Bilaterally. <laughs> Bilaterally. Yeah, this is, I saved the worst ones for last. That, that Wallenberg and this one are, 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 are tough, but uh, again, it makes, you, it makes you put your mind to work. So we have, we have something that sounds like a peripheral neuropathy a little bit. We have um, upper motor neuron signs and we have lower motor neuron signs mixed. Oh, we're in the court. We're oh, the court. yes. Do you yeah. say anything about the gait, like their walk? Uh, no, I don't, I don't, wait, hang on a second, this is seven. No, I didn't put anything in, in here about the gait, but how about if I just say that, um, um, let me look here. Um, I would say, it, it, and I'm remembering, I'm remembering back. So this, um, this, there was no ataxia in the gait. Um, there was no wide base or, or scissoring gait or anything like that. Um, what about like any EMG results or something like that? Oh yeah. So, so, um, well, let Susan, let's set, um, uh, set aside or, or which one, who was talking with that Susan or it's Tracy, but I'm with Susan, so that's okay. Oh, okay, Tracy, right. So, so uh, I am going to say that that is an awesome suggestion, and we would absolutely get that test in this patient. Okay, right? so because I'm thinking like, uh, I don't know if this is right, but uh, some type of maybe an ALS type issue? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. 100%. And the, and the reason why we're concerned about that is the presence of both upper and lower motor neuron signs, which is pathognomonic for ALS until proven otherwise. Well, true. Um, and you said something about the interosseous muscle off, off you know, oftentimes yep. you can see that, you yep. know, in the hands, that atrophy. So, yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, 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 Dead flat giveaway on this is the presence of both upper and lower motor neuron signs. Um, ALS is, for, for Sam, ALS is a disorder of the anterior horn cells in the, in the spinal cord. Um, the, the red herring on here is the sensory stuff. Sorry, Sharon. <laughs> this, patient, <That's> okay. <laughs> this patient actually had diabetes as well. Okay. 
<laughs> so you are correct. There was a peripheral issue going on here. Tracy, good job. Really nice job. Yeah, Tracy, awesome. Um, okay, so uh, Sharon, I think we're we're caught up with ourselves now, right? Yeah, we're about an hour in. So okay, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I I I have a couple more if anybody wants to keep going or if everybody's had an overdose. So I'm, I'm happy to to stop here. You you just let me know and I'm happy to do whatever. Answer questions, finish oh, the last two cases, but whatever you want to do. I'm not really sure what Sam thinks because I know she's just. But I, I would be interested in in listening to the other two cases as well. Sure. Yeah, I, I would yeah. like. To, I would like to hear right. the cases, Karen. They're great. Yep. Yep. Actually, I'll keep going. Okay. So very good. Uh, ALS. Excellent. So in case number seven, we have a, a 30 year old male who has a chief complaint of left arm pain and tingling. So just off the top of your bat, I mean, off the top of, of, of your head, um, where, where we think somebody might have an issue in this neuraxis, this topography and the cervical spinal cord yeah right so um, yes um anytime you have left arm pain and it would be even be more obvious if i had said that he complained of the arm pain radiating down from his neck into his arm mm -hmm. uh, that's very very typical complaint of uh, radiculopathy um so yeah that is right like at the top of the list uh for for um possibility of an etiology. So here's the exam. Mental status, cranial nerves, cerebellar and coordination testing are normal, gait's normal. And now we have motor, um, the tone is normal. All of his strength is normal, except for he has some um, weakness in the uh, left biceps, brachioradialis and wrist extensors. And we have some decreased sensory uh, modality or sensory appreciation for light touch. Uh, I mean, to, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, for decreased pin in the left first and second digits uh, and the other sensation uh, is intact. So um, everybody still uh, agree with uh, cervical area being the most likely? So now I'm thinking maybe like some type of compressive neuropathy or something, thinking about in the ulnar or, I guess, uh, or the, um, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank, the, like in the median, if you're talking about the first and the second digits, I guess that's pain, but I'm sorry, did you say numbness or tingling in the? Tingling. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pain and tingling down the arm into okay. the first and second digits. Hmm. Hmm. Still thinking. I think that could be like C4, C5, or it could be more peripheral, the radial nerve, right guys? Yeah, I was thinking like a median nerve or a ulnar nerve type issue. But like she was saying, even from the cervical, like that four or five comes down to the bicep and of course seven goes to the middle finger. But you know, I, I don't know, Let's, I, I'm still thinking cervical, but we'll see. I, I like cervical too. So let me just um, talk for a second about median nerve dysfunction. So uh, median nerve innervates the um, abductor pollicis brevis, uh, which abducts the thumb in sort of a perpendicular manner. Um, I don't know if you guys can see how I'm holding my thumb right here. So if you're as hard as I'm blocking my view, if you hold your thumb perpendicular to your palm, and then try to push your thumb towards your palm, that's abductor pollicis brevis. And then opponents. So if you bring your thumb over to the base of your pinky finger and, and try and pull it out, that's opponents. Those are median nerve innervated muscles that for like in carpal tunnel, uh, you would see weakness in, in those muscles. Um, I, I think the, the whole notion of cervical is, is um, um, a, a better choice because of the biceps and brachioradialis and wrist extensor weakness. Um, and, you know, um, so we're thinking about what nerves, let's look here. Oh, so deep tendon reflexes are absent at the biceps and brachioradialis. 
otherwise normal. And so this still, this right here just goes along with the whole um, supposition of, of, of cervical um, abnormality. And actually this patient had a um, left C6 radiculopathy. So excellent going right for the, the cervical cord, even based on the, just the chief complaint alone. Um, and remember that C6 does a sen you know, extend sensation down into the first and second digits. Seven is the middle finger, like Tracy said, and, and then um, C8 is the fourth and fifth digit. So good, great, right to cervical cord, that's awesome. And then our last case. Um, so we have a 39-year-old female with a complaint of double vision. Where might we see some, where might we find uh, an abnormality here? I think that's at the optic chiasm, right? If we're pressing there, are we gonna get double vision? Um, no, not exactly. So, so are you, what are you thinking? Like a pituitary? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for, and again, more on Sam's behalf, than in case you don't remember, a pituitary abuts the optic chiasm. And so when you have a pituitary tumor that's pressing on the middle of the optic chiasm, you get a, a bitemporal hemianopsia. So is that, it's not double vision, but you have a field, a bilateral field defect mm -hmm. in the temporal yeah. fields. Oh. Mm. So keep going there. I okay. was thinking um, some cere cerebellar type issue. <laughs> okay. So, and, and remember, cere cerebellum um, predominantly does, you know, coordination of, of movements. Right? I guess occipital, I guess I'm uh, in my head, like, you know, I'm thinking like, um, of course, you know, I'm probably going down a path too far at this point, but I, is this, does this person have headaches? No. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Keep going then. No, that, that's okay. So, so again, for, for, for review benefit, um, your, uh, our eyes move together in the, at the same oh, time. It's the cranial nerve palsy. It's one of the cranial nerve palsies. <laughs> okay. 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 You're thinking like the third nerve cranial nerve, third nerve palsy, right? Is the double vision? I think so. Yeah, but, that's what well, it was. When I open both eyes, what's the what's the story? Oh, okay, wait! <laughs> you guys are so excited. I love it. Um, so wait, let me just finish about the 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 binoculars, right? The uh -huh. eyes are in alignment, and that allows us to see one vision, right? One image. Uh -huh. um, if you took your binoculars, if you took a pair of binoculars and you had one binocular looking a little bit to the right and one looking straight ahead and you look through uh, the glasses, you would see two, uh, two of something uh, mm -hmm. because the binoculars weren't lined up. And it's the same thing with our eyes. If they are not in conjugate alignment, um, we can see two of something. The, the yeah. exception to this particular rule is somebody who has esotropia or exotropia. They've just been living with a lazy eye. You know, yeah. they don't see two. Um, but for someone who's had conjugate alignments forever and ever, and now all of a sudden they are disconjugate, uh, they will see two of something. And mm -hmm. that what keeps the eyes in alignment is coordination of all the extraocular muscles, mm -hmm. right? So your superior mm -hmm. oblique, your inferior oblique, your medial rectus, lateral rectus, and inferior and superior obliques. Um, the cranial nerves that control those muscles are three, four, and six. So if you have, if, if you have one of those muscles not working because the innervation is off, you could have double vision. Uh -huh. So brainstem is on the table here, uh -huh. right? What else? Um, I think cortex could still be on the table, the occipital lobe. Right. So remember, occipital lobe is really just for the processing of visual information that comes in. 
generally, if there's an abnormality there, it's not, um, the result isn't double vision or diplopia. Okay. Okay. But uh, you're thinking about vision, so that's good. All right, well, let's keep going. Um, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, did you say it was monocular? Yeah, what, what does double vision, I'm sorry, did I miss the part you said it was? It, it double vision with both policy, eyes open. It would be with one eye, you know, it would be with one eye closed, right? So did you say that? Nope. Mm -mm. Okay. No, right. you, you, uh, uh, if, if somebody has double vision monocularly, that's yeah. probably going to be more of a refraction or, a, or a, uh, what is the word? <sighs> um, help me. Astigmatism mm -hmm. or, or a okay. retinal thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say if she closed one eye or closed the other eye, there would be no double vision for her. Okay. So it's yeah, binocular. I, I think she's cranial nerve three because I'm pretty sure the um, the lid, the palpebral or something, the there's a cranial nerve that innervates that lid and, lid and it's cranial nerve three, right? So she yep, has- That's correct. Cranial nerve three innervates the levator palpebrae, right? So uh -huh. if you have a dysfunction there, you can have, you can have ptosis, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said no sustained after of sustained um, of gaze. Yeah. Is there any issue with, uh, can they move their forehead? She has. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is it, isn't cranial nerve three down and out? So that's, it takes away the cranial nerve three, doesn't it, Karen? Um, yes. Oh, Oops. sorry. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. So here we go. I'm sorry. I was trying to get to the second part of the cranial nerve testing. So this patient has variable disconjugate ocular alignment on sustained gazes to the right and to the left with, she reports diplopia when that happens. So um, what that means is that um, if you ever follow your finger, I, I like to use a light because when I shine a light on their eyes, I can see if the light is shining on the exact same spot in both eyes. Um, I really shouldn't hear somebody tell me they have diplopia, but if I have a light in the middle of a pupil on one eye and then to the side of a pupil on the other, they're not aligned. Um, so the reflection really helps uh, see that a little bit better. So so yeah, the patient looks straight ahead, no diplopia. She looks to the side. She doesn't have any diplopia, but the longer you hold that light or your finger out there, then she starts to see two. Did you say she has any color dysfunction or anything like that? Nope. Okay. That rolls out off the right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the cranial nerve testing is normal. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So. Uh -huh. We're remembering that. So she gets ptosis when she holds her gaze up for a period of time, and then she gets diplopia when she holds her gaze out to the side, either side, uh, for a short period of time. Any other type of generalized weakness anywhere or swallowing issues or no, subtle weakness with deltoids? Oh, on her pit. Mm, did you check in acetylcholine? There you go. <laughs> okay, I got you. All there right. you go. Oh, myasthenia. Myasthenia, yes, this is a neuromuscular junction problem, right? Yeah. And the key to that, knowing that that's on the top of your list is this prolonged or repetitive or sustained movement or repetitive testing against resistance, right? Because myasthenia is a fatigable weakness. The more you work a muscle, the more the, uh, the the acetylcholine doesn't do its job because you have antibodies to the acetylcholine receptors. That's right. Excellent. And so in myasthenia, because it's strictly a neuromuscular junction problem, you have no sensory complaints, um, no reflex problems, no cerebellar abnormalities, no gait problem. It's the key here is fatigable weakness. Um, that should, that should make it jump right out. And I think that, what was the word that got you, Tracy, the repetitive? Yeah, the repetitiveness and then, you know, um, yeah, exactly. It was the fatigability for sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
All right, so any questions? I think that's that's the it for my cases. Uh, we had actually had two questions in the chat box, and it was Carmen saying, is it myasthenia gravis? It is myasthenia <laughs> gravis, no. Carmen. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, so Carmen had that too. I don't know who had it first, but she was pretty close because I looked at the time and we came in at 7.50, so it was yeah. pretty close. So yeah. Tracy, thank you so much for... Um, for uh, engaging because it was amazing. You did a super good job and so did you, Sam, and so, yeah. did, um, and so did Carmen via the chat. So yes. anybody have any questions for Karen before we end our session? Uh, just thank you guys so much for letting me participate. That was so fun. Yeah, well, I'm happy you stayed. I know we ran a little bit over than plan time, but um, this is, and again, I can't, I, can't, I don't think I could be more excited about being able to do this because this is a, one of the most fun aspects of practicing neurology is the, you know, the detective work and trying to figure things out and then, and then to prove yourself right. You, just, you know, um, that's, uh, that, that is always very fun. Um, so I, I'm so glad that you guys came on. I, I, I know this is rough to do at the end of a busy day, um, but I really appreciate it. I, I hope you got something out of it we're able to take something away from it and um uh sharon you're gonna give sam my contact information and we'll we'll have a chat um just reach out to me sam and and any any other last minute questions happy to answer them so i'll have karen's lecture uh, recorded and posted on the app to app website and uh, karen if you also send me your slides in a pdf format but okay mind I'll also post them as well sure. so they're all free to you and we're super happy that you came tonight and uh feel free to enjoy all our free lectures okay thanks Sharon I really appreciate it and everybody thanks for coming again and and have a great night thanks again Bye -bye. all right y'all take care